Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marielle Dimsey, and I'm the Secretary General of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre. It is my pleasure and honour today to introduce David Rifkin to present the HKIC lecture during the Seoul ADR Festival. Uh, as many of you, I'm, I'm sure, familiar with David's name, he needs no introduction, but I will endeavour to do a brief one nonetheless. He is the co-chair of the HKIAC and has been a partner at Deborah Voice and Plimpton for the past four decades. He served as co-chair of Deborah Voice's International Dispute Resolution Group for more than 20 years, and he is a past president of the International Bar Association. He has accolades for his work that are too numerous to mention, but I will focus on a couple of highlights. Uh, most recently, Chambers Global in 2022 identified David as one of the top, international, top 10 international arbitration practitioners worldwide, describing him as an extraordinarily bright, thoughtful and clear advocate. Of particular relevance for this occasion, David has acted for many Korean clients over the years, as well as many in many other Asian-based disputes. Uh, David will be retiring from Deborah Voice at the end of the year and will continue to practice as an arbitrator. Today, um, we have the honour and privilege of hearing David present on the topic of changing expectations for counsel and arbitrators. He will discuss the changes in the practice of international arbitration throughout the past four decades of his practice as counsel and arbitrator, and will focus on what comes next for parties, counsel and arbitrators. I would ask you all if you have questions of David to put them in the Q&A box, um, and these will be addressed at the end of the presentation. And for now, I hand over to David and welcome him to, to this presentation. Thank you, Marielle, for that very warm introduction. And thank you for inviting me to give this talk to open the Seoul ADR Festival. Uh, for those of you in Seoul, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. Uh, I've had many, many uh, trips to Seoul over the decades uh, in acting for Korean clients. I've always enjoyed it. Uh, I had my first post-pandemic trip to Seoul uh, this summer, uh, and it was great to be to be back. Um, but I'm happy to be doing this uh, virtually, and uh, uh, and thank you for for joining me on on your Monday morning. Um, as as Mariel mentioned, I want to give uh, a bit of history of international arbitration and talk about how expectations have changed over the decades, but particularly focus on where we are today and where I hope we will be going uh, in the near future. Um, I started at Devavoy's, as, as Mario mentioned, in uh, the very beginning of 1982, after a, a year of a judicial clerkship, um, and actually after um, a three and a half month honeymoon, uh, where my wife and I traveled all around Asia, uh, including some substantial time in Hong Kong, uh, though unfortunately not in Korea. I didn't get to Korea until a number of years later. Um, but, you know, in, in early 1982, uh, no firm, including Debevoise, had an international arbitration practice as such. Uh, it wasn't taught as a separate topic in law school. Uh, you couldn't really envision international arbitration uh, to be a career. Um, but I knew I enjoyed litigation. I enjoyed the intellectual challenge of it and, and the opportunity to work with clients and help them. Uh, and at the same time, I'd grown up in New York City with two very international parents. And so I knew to the extent I wanted to do, uh, I could, I wanted to do an international practice in my career. Um, I was fortunate that Debevoise had won a very substantial case in the mid 1970s, the Topco case against Libya. There, as you may remember, there were three oil expropriation cases arising out of the Libyan oil expropriation in 1973. Um, Bob von Meeren, who is our, our, our senior partner who led that case at the time, um, and, and the firm won uh, the best of the three awards. They were all public. Um, ours was the only one to obtain uh, uh, a specific performance, which allowed the firm to uh, go after Libyan oil wherever it was and led to the best settlement with Libya of the three. And that therefore already created some reputation for the firm and for Bob. And lo and behold, uh, my first day at Devil Boys uh, in the beginning of 1982, a new international arbitration came into Bob and he asked me to, to work on it, uh, which I was delighted. Uh, it involved a, a potential tax issue between uh, a small US oil company and the government of Indonesia. 
And I learned my first lesson in terms of expectations uh, for uh, clients um, and parties in, in the practice of law. And that was about a month or so into the case, um, the tax partner who was working with us uh, came to Bob and me and said, you know what, I actually, I think the Indonesians are probably right. Um, uh, so the, uh, what we're complaining about uh, probably doesn't pass muster. Um, and, you know, uh, Bob, and I'm sure he could have done what I'm sure many lawyers would have done, which would have said, well, we have a, a basis for bringing this claim and we're going to bring it and we'll see what happens. Uh, but Bob instead um, uh, went to the client and explained it to him. Uh, they weren't that happy to hear it, but they understood. And we were able to work something out with the government of Indonesia that was, uh, was acceptable. So it was a great lesson in the practice of law and the proper way to, to deal with clients really right at the beginning. Um, in the mid-1980s, I was fortunate as well to work on a very large international arbitration uh, for a U.S. natural gas company, which involved, which had signed a contract with uh, Algeria and Sunatrack back in the mid-1970s during the gas shortages by the early 1980s. And this was one of the earliest LNG contracts, so facilities and ships had to be built, uh, government approvals had to be given. And by 1983, when performance could actually begin, we were in the middle of a gas glut our client couldn't sell it anywhere uh, uh, and therefore declared economic force majeure. And uh, for those of you who know, that is not something that really exists under most civil law systems or common law systems like the US or England. Uh, but the contract was governed by Algerian law. And while it's, uh, Algerian law largely models the French uh, civil code, uh, uh, the very article one uh, says that it's to be interpreted according to the principles of Islamic law. Uh, and Islamic law has a much broader doctrine of excuse. Um, and we were able to put in papers um, uh, that really brought out uh, both as a fact uh, the factual uh, change that had occurred in the market over the over the uh, nearly decade that it had taken to perform the contract, uh, and very strong arguments uh, on the doctrine of excuse, uh, none of which I think Sonatrack was expecting. They had put in a very French law. Uh, a set of memorials. Um, and uh, as a result, again, we were able to work out a, a very favorable settlement for the client because we showed we had a very strong case. Um, it was fascinating. I learned a lot about the uh, joy of working with foreign laws, uh, learning about them. Uh, one of our experts uh, was an Iranian Ayatollah who spent 99, I'm sorry, who spent half of his year in Qum with the other 99 Ayatollahs and half of his year at Princeton teaching Near Eastern religion. So we, we learned a lot. Um, an interesting footnote to that case is that the um, uh, mid-level associate at Bredon Pratt, which was representing Sonatrack at the time, uh, was Emmanuel Gaillard. So uh, we got to know each other uh, early on uh, through that case. Um, but again, I think it, it showed a lot about the, the role that international arbitration could play and, and, and the joys of, of, of factual development and, and working with foreign law. I'll mention one other case from the 1980s, uh, which is also something of a landmark, particularly in Asia, in Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, and that was the Builders Federal case uh, um, in Singapore. Uh, we represented Builders Federal, which was a contractor um, uh, in, a, in a, a construction project uh, in Singapore. Um, uh, obviously, you know, like many construction contracts, there were claims. Um, I was a senior associate by then, uh, but the two partners running the case uh, were on their way to Singapore for the first procedural hearing with the sole arbitrator um, when I received a telex, and again, this tells you a little bit how practice has changed, uh, from the Singapore lawyer Wong Meng Meng, uh, then uh, uh, head of the Law Society in Singapore, and no doubt known to many of you, um, saying that he had obtained an injunction from the Singapore courts against our participating in the arbitration because we were not licensed to practice in Singapore. Um, again, as interesting aside, uh, his junior on that case was Sundaresh Menon. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until later that Sundaresh and I realized that we both had played this role in that case. And uh, we've, we've talked about it publicly since then. Um, I had to find, again, given the difference in technology in those days, 
I had to find a way to get American Airlines to get a message to uh, Bob Von Muren and the other partner and when, as they were changing planes in London to fly to Singapore to let them know that this injunction had been issued because I didn't know if they were going to be arrested at the airport or, or they, I thought they better be prepared for whatever came. Um, uh, we were able to conduct the hearing through a, a Singapore lawyer who they quickly hired as effectively as a mouthpiece. Um, the case settled before we were able to appeal the decision and it set Singapore back for probably about a decade in terms of being a seat in arbitration. Um, one beautiful thing about Hong Kong was that uh, it quickly responded to the um, uh, to this uh, lesson and uh, 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 amended the Hong, the Hong Kong arbitration ordinance to specifically permit uh, 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 anyone uh, who did uh, to represent their parties in uh, in international arbitrations conducted in Hong Kong, um, which did a lot to further Hong Kong as as uh, e the major seat in Asia for 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 quite a while. Um, so by the late late 1980s, we as a firm were starting to develop a, a regular international practice. We were uh, having cases come in much more regularly. Um, the firm was encouraging uh, us to become active in international arbitration institutions um, uh, and to begin to shape them. Um, during the 1980s, we also saw the impact of the UNSA trial model law, which, as you know, was passed in 1985, that, and the case law from the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal. So uh, by, by the, the, a decade later, by the late 1990s, international arbitration had truly matured into a, a real practice. There were many more participants. Um, though they were largely focused in Europe and North America at that time, uh, there wasn't really an internationalization of the of procedure. Arbitrators would still largely follow uh, their own local procedure, uh, and the technology hadn't yet developed. I remember I was chair of the IBA Arbitration Committee in 2000, um, and it being 2000, we did we did a mock arbitration, which we um, uh, uh, modestly called the arbitration of the millennium. Uh, we had a lot of uh, leading arbitrators uh, 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 play various roles uh, uh, in this mock arbitration, uh, which went on for a full day at the IBA Amsterdam, in Amsterdam. Um, and we also had a court reporter uh, do, uh, show live note up on a screen uh, uh, throughout. And for many, that was the first time they had seen uh, live transcription of of uh, testimony. Um, so that again gives a sense of just how much we progressed in a rather short period of time. I also remember around that period of time uh, that I was conducting a, an arbitration in Europe and there was a Swiss uh, practitioner on the other side, not a regular international arbitration practitioner, I should say, uh, who after I did my opening using a PowerPoint um, referred kind of uh, sneeringly to uh, Mr. Rivkin's video or Mr. Rivkin's movie. Um, and of course, that's become very standard. So since 2000, in these last two decades, obviously, we've seen explosive growth uh, in the field. Uh, the number of cases worldwide has grown tremendously, um, much, much greater geographic diversity in every way. Uh, the parties involved, council involved, uh, the growth of seats uh, around the world that are strong and uh, often turn to um, Asia in particular has taken a, a central role in, in international arbitration um, over the last two decades. Um, in the first Queen Mary uh, arbitration survey in 2006, no, our, no Asian seat made the top five rankings. Um, but in the most recent one, in, to, in 2021, just 15 years later, um, London shared the first position of most preferred with Singapore, and Hong Kong was right there next to them in third place. Um, Beijing uh, was uh, 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 sixth, uh, along with New York, and Shanghai came in an eighth. So Asian seats comprised 50% of the top 10 preferred seats in the world. Um, and again, in the first survey in 2006, uh, the, the highest ranked arbitral institutes were the ICC, LCIA, uh, AAA, ICDR, and now in 2021, the five most popular institutes were the ICC, the SIAC, the HKIAC right there, and CTAC. Uh, so three of the top five most popular institutions were again headquartered in Asia. It just shows the, uh, the massive role that Asia now plays in, in arbitration. And you can see that as well through the growth in the number of cases handled by 
uh, the major arbitration seats, including, of course, uh, the HKIAC. You can also um, see just a, a vast number, a vast increase in the number of, of people playing a role in international arbitration in every way, as counsel, as arbitrators, as involved in international arbitration institutions. You see the growth of young arbitrator groups in virtually every arbitration institution and form. Um, uh, Henry Alvarez and I joke that in the mid 1980s, um, the young arbitrator group was him and me sitting in the back row of a, of a big international arbitration conference. Um, but, uh, you know, just a, a quick sign of that, when I was chair of the IBA arbitration committee in the late 1990s to early 2000s, or when I became chair, I think we had maybe four officers of the committee. Um, we expanded it a bit under my leadership as we, as we expanded the work. Um, but just this week at the IBA annual conference in, in Miami, uh, the arbitration committee announced its new slate of officers for the coming year. You may have seen it in GAR. And there are 42 officers uh, from 25 different countries just in that one committee. So it, I think it's just a great sign of the changing role and changing expectations um, all around. Um, obviously, these last couple of decades have been marked by a number of trends, the growth of ISDS, um, uh, which uh, I think was largely triggered uh, not just by the growth of international trade, um, but also by the award in 2003 in the CME versus Czech Republic case, um, which Debevoise uh, was fortunate enough to win, which uh, led to, as you know, a $350 million award or Euro award against Czech Republic that was paid. And that was the first very public sign that in, that investment treaties could be used to remedy uh, investors' rights. And uh, you can see really from that award, the curve of in growth of, of ICSID and other investment treaty cases growing. Of course, now a new trend is the pushback against uh, ISDS, and we'll see where that goes. Um, we've seen a more internationalization of the practice, and at the same time, uh, creation of more standards and, and codes and guidelines, um, all of which probably began with the IBA Rules of Evidence in 1999. I was very proud to be chair of the committee at that point. Um, but uh, as you know, there have been many other guidelines that have come out of both the IBA and of other institutions like uh, the Chartered Institute, uh, the LCIA Annex on Party Representation, and, and many others. Um, the positives of, of these uh, guidelines and standards uh, is that it's really leveled the playing field. It's made it easier to enter the field. Um, it's created greater transparency, all of which is good. To some extent, you, it, it may have reduced some flexibility um, as parties may, at least it's a perception that parties are supposed to conduct cases in a certain way, which we've, which we've fought to, to prevent and which I'll talk about a little bit more later. We've obviously seen a greater complexity in cases and um, um, that, more inter that they're more international and there's a lot more at stake. Um, when um, I won the award for Occidental Petroleum against Ecuador as the first billion dollar award, now we read in CAR about a new billion dollar award uh, almost every week. Uh, so things have really changed. Um, uh, but uh, uh, all of this has led to criticisms of the practice as you know, being too costly, taking too long, um, so rules have been revised, including the HKIACs, to make them more efficient, to give more control to the uh, uh, panel. Uh, that has certainly, again, changed the expectations for both parties and arbitrators. Um, but, uh, and I hope that will, will continue, but we still see in their most recent Queen Mary study, uh, efficiency is still a major concern. So now we have international arbitration is a, is a vast, sophisticated, very diverse practice it's much better in so many ways. There are more options for parties and counsel and many more arbitrators and, uh, uh, to choose from. But the innovation hasn't really taken hold yet in the way we hope that it should. It hasn't yet led to greater efficiency across the board. Um, uh, and uh, so what I wanted to do for the rest of this is talk about um, expectations going forward and how we hope that international arbitration can can change over the over the coming uh, decade in particular, and I'll begin by talking about expectations for arbitrators. Um, um, in 2015, in 
the keynote address at the HKIC's Arbitration Week program then, um, I stated a few broad principles in describing what the parties expect from arbitrators. They have to, of course, be independent and impartial, fully disclose any facts that may be relevant uh, to that determination. Arbitrators have to be fully versed in the factual record of the case and the relevant legal provisions uh, and decisions. They have to bring their experience to bear by proposing and then applying procedures that are appropriate for the case, that are cost effective, and that will resolve the case as efficiently as possible. Um, I note that this requirement of efficiency is actually written into many national arbitration laws now, including the Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance uh, in Section 46. Arbitrators have to carefully consider procedural issues as they arise and respond promptly based upon their knowledge of the record. They have to conduct the hearing attentively and make sure that evidence presented and the issues argued will assist them as effectively as possible in coming to their decision. And most importantly, perhaps they have to issue their award in a timely manner that meets the party's expectations and resolves the issues that have been put to them. That is, after all, why the parties have hired the arbitrators in the first place. So I don't think there can be any controversy that that's what parties expect of arbitrators, but the devil is in the details. And obviously all of us have seen a wide variety of behavior by arbitrators, uh, some of which has been more efficient and uh, more to the satisfaction of the party than others. My own view is that the future will be belong to well-prepared, creative, interactive arbitrators uh, who really work to satisfy the needs of the parties in the best possible way. And I would summarize the, the, the way those arbitrators could act by in three words dedication, creativity, and independence. So let me turn first to dedication. And that begins with availability for the parties, um, not just at the start of the case when you have to fill out the form that says you're available, but throughout the case. That means arbitrators shouldn't take on additional cases or additional work if they are going to interfere with the obligation that you've already undertaken to the parties in the cases that you have now ongoing. Um, and I would hope, I hope that international institutions, including the HKIAC and the KCAB, can write that obligation of availability into the, their agreement with the arbitrators as well, and not just ask about availability at the time. Um, uh, the dedication includes reading papers when they arrive and not in the week before the final merits hearing. Um, that can impact the case throughout because well-prepared arbitrators who understand the facts of the case, understand the issues, can respond quickly on procedural issues. They can use their knowledge of the record in an appropriate way. They can also be creative and uh, use some of the techniques that, that I'll talk about in a minute, um, but even change the procedure if it seems appropriate and once they learn more about the case. Um, a well-prepared arbitrator, a dedicated arbitrator, um, would not allow procedural games um, and disruptions to the schedule. Again, by understanding the case better um, and, and making it clear to the parties that um, that's simply not going to be countenanced, late requests for extensions or um, unsolicited submissions, uh, that kind of thing. Um, a dedicated arbitrator is, is carefully and closely involved at the hearing itself. Um, as a counsel, um, uh, uh, which obviously has been my main career over the last four decades, um, there's nothing worse than arbitrators who sit quietly uh, during, uh, during a, you know, a, an, an opening of an hour or two. Um, this either means they haven't yet read the papers and they're really learning what I'm saying for the first time, uh, or it means they've already made up their minds and, um, and <laughs> I'm speaking uh, and that it's all kind of unnecessary. Um, uh, Arbitrators, dedicated arbitrators, shouldn't be afraid to um, uh, to ask questions, to show the parties the concerns they have about their case, uh, to make sure that they understand the nature of certain arguments and how they relate to one another, or how one side's arguments actually respond uh, to the other. Um, well prepared arbitrators also, and dedicated arbitrators are also much more able to exclude irrelevant or uh, duplicative or cumulative evidence uh, uh, during the hearing itself. Um, uh, and the rules all permit this, and, and court cases give arbitrators that wide discretion. There shouldn't be a, a fear of, 
of a, a, a due process that'll somehow lead to overturning the award. Um, all of this, of course, um, you know, is while an arbitrator uh, has to remain neutral and impartial, but can nevertheless uh, challenge the parties on their on their arguments to make sure that they fully understand them. And I know as counsel, I want an arbitrator who will, if 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 he or she has some concerns about an aspect of my case, raise them with me so that I have an opportunity to address them. I'd much rather find out about those concerns at the hearing uh, than uh, in the award uh, um, uh, uh, several months later. Um, and that can, of course, be done while remaining uh, neutral and, in, in, um, and, and independent uh, and, of course, respectful of the parties. And then finally, a dedicated arbitrator issues an award on a timely basis. Um, that's why the arbitrators are, are hired. Um, that can, uh, in order to accomplish that, uh, arbitrators ought to schedule deliberations right at the beginning of the case to make sure they've blocked out the time. If, you, if they wait until the hearing, then undoubtedly conflicts of time are going to cause the deliberations not to begin until months after the hearing, when the impact of the hearing and the testimony you've heard will have been lost. Um, if you're a chair, a dedicated chair will save time shortly after the hearing to begin drafting the award while everything is fresh. Um, a dedicated arbitrator doesn't schedule back to back to back to back hearings. Um, which makes it impossible to, to do that and which leads to drafting awards again long after the hearing, long after um, memory has fa uh, faded. Um, so block out the time uh, for deliberations uh, right at the beginning. Um, and also a dedicated arbitrator would ask parties uh, to, um, um, really at the beginning of the case, what kind of award they want. I think many parties probably would be very happy to do without the first 50 pages of most awards that lay out the procedure and the arguments in a way that they already know. Um, and if that could you know, cut a month off the time when they get the award and it could save them uh, uh, a lot of money uh, that they owe to the arbitrators, I think a lot of our parties would, would, uh, um, uh, would, would choose that. And, you know, so I think that's, that's, that's what um, is expected uh, from a dedicated arbitrator. Um, creativity as well, choosing efficient procedures that are right for every case. Um, use your own experience and, and don't use a, a form file a procedural order number one. Um, as many of you know, I, I, I first spoke about that in my town elder speech, an article way back in 2008, starting from a blank piece of paper, really learning from the parties what they would, um, uh, uh, what the case is about, um, what are the issues, and how can they best be resolved, uh, and then using your experience to structure appropriate procedures. Um, and if an arbitrator follows my prior advice about being dedicated and, 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 and understanding and following, reading the uh, submissions right from the beginning, they can play a role right throughout the case Meetings with the parties now throughout the case after major submissions or at other times can be scheduled so easily. The, 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 pa the, the pandemic was obviously awful in so many, many ways, but in, in terms of international arbitration, we've improved our procedure and the opportunity to improve our procedure um, through virtual hearings. Um, you know, No longer do you have to worry about either a telephone hearing, which is very impersonal and doesn't work, or traveling halfway around the world for a three-hour hearing. So there ought to be much more interaction between the, the, the parties and the tribunal, and the tribunal ought to lead that. There can be room for something like the Kaplan opening, where um, after the first uh, submissions, the parties get together and, and give a long opening, and that can really then help structure uh, the rest of the case. Um, um, there can be more involvement in document uh, requests. Um, uh, I think that, uh, again, using our virtual uh, abilities, um, rather than having the request put out in the, the same form that uh, we used when uh, document requests were made and you had to go to a paper file at your clients, and so the request kind of would lead to where those papers were in, in somebody's file. Now, of course, everything's electronic, but we ask the requests in the same way. And then what, what does that lead? That leads the other side to come up with some keywords and, and think of some custodians and then to run those in order to try to answer those questions. Well, why not do that from the beginning? Why not ha um, have 
the party make the document request by using keywords and talking about particular custodians and then do this in an iterative way. Have the uh, recipient party run those, uh, run the search in that way and come back and say, you know, I'm sorry, that leads to a million documents. We've got to find a way to narrow it and then have some conversation about the ways it can be narrowed until you can get to some meaningful number. You may miss some key documents that way, but you miss some key documents right now. Um, but you're much more likely to get to a, a meaningful number of documents that can be reviewed with a lot less cost and can be much more useful uh, to the parties. So I hope that arbitrators will use these techniques much more. Um, hope arbitrators, again, dedicated ar and creative arbitrators will use preliminary issues much more. Uh, use all the new summary disposition rules that are uh, are, are, have been put into place over the last uh, uh, half, half decade. Um, uh, preliminary issues don't necessarily require the same level of, of standard uh, 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 proof that, that some of these uh, summary disposition rules, but they can still be used. Um, I had a series of cases a number of years ago for a political risk insurer where the issue of liability was quite um, unclear, but the um, um, uh, but uh, and would have required probably a week long hearing. Uh, it was very complex uh, issues of of uh, national law and international law. Um, but we felt strongly in each of those cases that even if there was coverage under the policy, um, there there was nothing owed under the policy because of particular terms in the policy or because of the particular facts. And so in each case, we told the, asked the arbitrator to put aside the issue of liability and have a one day hearing on which included factual hearings. It didn't have to be like a summary judgment motion in the US or England um, uh, where you can't argue facts, uh, where we had a factual hearing um, on damages. And in each of those three cases, the arbitrator agreed with us that even if there were liability under the policy, um, there were no damages and dismissed the case on that basis. Um, we need to find more creative approaches by arbitrators uh, and parties and counsel uh, uh, to use the, the flexibility that we have in international arbitration like that. It obviously not only led to a successful result for our client, but one that saved them a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, as you know, um, the, you know, the new exit rules have limited time uh, uh, limits. They have uh, put in um, a stronger mechanism to dispose of cases at an early stage. The ICC has put out guidance to arbitrators uh, about how to dispose of cases early on. Um, and as many of you know, I, I took the town elder concept that I first put out in 2008 and uh, last year issued some town elder rules that are effectively a, uh, uh, a decision tree uh, set of rules. Uh, which could be appropriate in some cases. And, and I hope that uh, they will be useful to the community. Um, so a, a, a dedicated and, crea a, a, and creative arbitrator considers the cost effects of procedural decisions um, at every stage um, and can also provide a, a, a true pre-hearing conference before the, before the merits hearing um, where guidance can be given to the arbitrators about the issues that the parties uh, that the arbitrators actually feel uh, are going to be important that they want to hear more about uh, at the hearing itself. Um, and that will be um, important. And finally, I think uh, dedicated and creative arbitrators uh, can um, uh, can assist the parties more in finding resolution. Um, the ICC Commission is working on, a report to propose a number of uh, techniques for arbitrators uh, and parties to use ADR to settle cases early on. Um, and I think our ar arbitrators can do uh, that much more. Uh, so if, um, if an arbitrator is well prepared and, and dedicated, as I've said, all of these um, should be easy to do and, and when they are appropriate for each case. And as I said, Arbitrators don't have to be afraid about pushing back to the parties and, and making these kinds of judgments. Virtually all of the rules have been revised to give tribunals much more control over the procedures. Um, and we've seen uh, um, that case law supports arbitrators in doing so. The IBA Arbitration Committee put out a study uh, a few years ago looking at cases, uh, uh, how cases where arbitrators had dismissed 
uh, on summary disposition of some kind, uh, uh, and and it had been taken to the court. The courts had not set aside those awards because all the law requires is that arbitrators hear issues that are effectively material and relevant to the decision of the case. And if there's only one issue that is relevant to the actual decision of the case, an arbitrator doesn't have to hear the evidence on all the other issues. Um, um, and so I think, uh, yeah, the case law supports that. And I hope that arbitrators um, will be much more uh, proactive uh, in that way. Again, I mentioned HKIAC Article 22 as, as one example of giving uh, arbitrators uh, much more power. And I certainly hope, as, as Mario mentioned, um, uh, at the end of the year, I retire from Deva Boys. I, I, I take off my council hat and put on my full-time arbitrator hat, and I hope that um, I'll be able to, to serve the parties um, in this way. I mentioned independence as the third um, uh, tier of what a, a, a good arbitrator should do in, in the next decade. The IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest have been used um, very effectively. Uh, we've started to see court cases in the UK uh, in, um, in Colombia and other civil law jurisdictions in the U.S. use the guidelines as an indication, not of their own national law, but of international expectations. Um, and the IBA Arbitration Committee is now looking at updating those guidelines, though interestingly, a survey that was reported at the, at the conference this week said that about two-thirds of respondents said, yeah, the guidelines really already work pretty much the way um, uh, the way they should, but the uh, they are going to look at uh, some uh, potential uh, uh, improvements in them, um, uh, uh, including perhaps general standards of pra or practical examples uh, regarding issue conflict or um, third party funding, arbitrator disclosures. I think the the survey showed that. What, what people would like is even more examples in part two of the IBA guidelines, uh, which I think have been helpful. So a little bit of the, um, uh, 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 on, uh, 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 that's been, uh, you know, sort of changing expectations, what I think parties are going to expect of arbitrators uh, going forward. Um, let me talk for just a minute about council conduct in many ways expectations for counsel are just the mirror image of what I've been speaking about uh, for uh, arbitrators. It's to use uh, your own experience to develop the most uh, efficient and the best procedures uh, for the case. Um, given the cost pressures that we all see that our clients are undertaking, they need clients, they need their counsel to focus on efficiency. Um, and that will lead to effective dispute resolution uh, uh, for them. Of course, you want to try to structure the case in a way that's going to work best for your client. Um, but if you look, for example, at the Debevoise protocol on efficiency, which we first put out about a decade ago and we updated, if you look at the 25 <coughs> or so steps in, in that protocol, most of them are not just procedures that would make the case uh, more efficient. Most of them are procedures that are also just good advocacy. Uh, it's good advocacy to look for uh, an early resolution of the case. It's good advocacy to look for a, a settlement and to try to structure the case in a way that will make settlement come uh, more easily. It's good advocacy um, not to just toss um, a dozen volumes of exhibits at the arbitrators and, let, and leave them in a way so that they, they're not going to read any of it before the hearing. Um, but to prepare a single volume of the key exhibits that you really want the arbitrators to read so they understand the case before the hearing, and then give them however many other volumes it takes to provide evidence um, that needs to be there in case an issue arises to, to, to show that you do have evidence to, to meet your burden of proof on those points. But often the arbitrators may, may never need to look at that. It may not become an issue, or if they need to look at it, they'll know it's there. Um, so you know, that's one of the procedures we put into the Deva Voice protocol, um, but also it's just good advocacy because if you do that, you, you have a much better chance that the arbitrators are going to read through the exhibits you want them to read, not just read the memorial before you get to the hearing. Um, you know, again, uh, effective, uh, dedicated, uh, creative counsel will adhere to schedules, 
um, will not play games, will not base, make baseless challenges to arbitrators simply to uh, slow it down um, and not misrepresent uh, the facts of the case law. Again, that's not just uh, that, that time and again, that shows that that's not good advocacy. Um, our, and arbitrators are getting increasingly uh, frustrated by counsel who do and will hold it against them in, in, in costs, orders, or otherwise. The IBA guidelines on party representation haven't received quite the attention that the guidelines on conflicts of interest for arbitrators, but they're there. And I think they're, they're approaching a, an international standard um, that we've seen. Um, and I, as I pointed out in my 2015 Seoul uh, lecture, uh, which was on ethics and arbitration, um, it is unethical under civil law systems and common law systems around the world, uh, including in, in Korea uh, under Article uh, uh, 2 of the Attorney at Law Ethics Bill, uh, not to distort the facts or make false statements or not to make false arguments or submit false evidence in trial proceedings and shall not instigate or induce witnesses to false sta uh, uh, statements. So um, the, uh, while the party guidelines received some criticism at the time that they didn't reflect um, uh, differing norms in, in uh, uh, professional codes around the world, um, there is no doubt that making arguments that misrepresent the, the facts or the law um, uh, is unethical under almost every code. And, uh, and, it, it, and, and in the end, it doesn't serve your client's purpose because sooner or later the arbitrators find out the facts and then you've just lost your credibility. So, um, uh, those are, I think those are the key expectations. Again, I, I spent more time talking about them in the arbitrator context, but I think uh, those are expectations that we can place on counsel going forward over the next decade. Um, I also think the expectations for counsel and arbitrators over the next decade are going to be shaped by a number of other factors sort of outside of that. Um, one is the growing impact of ESG. Um, we're going to see disputes arising um, with ESG as the substance of the disputes. Um, we've seen uh, CEDAR put out uh, some draft rules um, on, uh, uh, on ESG disputes. The Arbitration Committee of the IBA, again, is doing a study on that. Um, I think uh, green arbitration and, and taking the green pledge and doing what we can uh, to uh, uh, reduce paper, uh, to um, uh, make hearings more virtual to reduce our carbon footprint in cases is is certainly part of the changing expectation for counsel and arbitrators. Uh, another trend that is clearly going to shape our next decade is data protection and cybersecurity. There are many protocols out there now on on uh, how to protect data. Um, we haven't seen a first major data breach in an international arbitration, but we all know there's a lot of of important and confidential information that uh, is is. Uh, sent around in arbitrations, and we can expect that sooner or later uh, that's going to happen. And, uh, um, and it's up to all of us to make sure that doesn't happen in one of our cases. Um, the challenges to ISDS that we're seeing uh, and the public attention to arbitration that those challenges are bringing are going to shape uh, expectations for parties and counsel in the next decade. Um, and finally, I would also mention the growth and influence of alternatives to international arbitration are going to shape uh, our expectations. Um, uh, if, if we do not follow the kinds of creative uh, procedures that I was describing before, parties are going to turn away from international arbitration because of the time and cost. And they're go going to go to institutions like the Singapore International Commercial Court or the DIFC uh, Court or the new commercial courts that have been set up in countries like the France and Netherlands. Or of course, we know that the UK courts have long been used for that purpose. So um, we see the growth of these commercial courts as a challenge to international arbitration to make us all better. Um, and that certainly must shape our expectations uh, in the next decade. So as I said, the next decade, I truly believe is going to focus on efficiency. I know this has been said before, um, but I have good reason to, be, to believe that it will actually happen um, in the coming years uh, because of of, of some new uh, influences. The ones I just mentioned, for example, the time and cost pressure that is growing, um, the, the more the public policy is involved in international arbitration and the public attention to arbitration uh, generally, 
um, the new tools that we have at our disposal uh, because of the pandemic um, and because of um, the availability of a growing number of alternatives. Uh, so we have to be better in order to uh, keep the parties using international arbitration. And counsel and arbitrators who best demonstrate the dedication, the creativity, the independence, the ethical behavior um, that I've just mentioned um, will be the most sought after uh, by clients and by parties. So I hope that's been helpful to all of you and I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks so much, David. Um, it's not only be helpful, I think it's it's an incredible privilege to listen to how your career has developed over the last 40 years and, and hear anecdotes from cases in which you were involved, which are sort of the classics for, for people coming up after you in the international arbitration world. So I think that's been a fantastic reflection on how things have changed. And um, I invite everyone to put their questions into the Q&A box, but I, I've got a couple that I'd like to start with. Um, and one of the things is, and I, this is this has been sort of a very reflective exercise, and I, I'd like to know what your advice to people coming up in, in their international arbitration careers now, um, what, what kind of advice you'd have for them? Sure, I think, um, uh, I think one is to um, do your best to understand how other um, uh, legal uh, jurisdictions work. Um, as I said, I um, I was fortunate early in my career uh, to have a case like the Panhandle case where I learned all about Islamic law and uh, the Arab civil codes and the civil law civil codes like the French civil code. Um, I think it's very important. We all do international cases. We don't do cases under our own law. We don't do cases civil law. Uh, practitioners don't. Uh, will do common law cases and vice versa. Um, and I think understanding how the law develops in other jurisdictions is important. Um, if you are young and have an opportunity to do a secondment at a at a firm in a, in in a different type of jurisdiction um, that's a great opportunity but otherwise uh, to 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 get involved in cases where you're going to, to learn that um, I think second um, getting to be involved in uh, the young arbitrator groups um, um, and young you know most of those groups young means 40 45 so there's still a lot of opportunity uh, for people. <laughs> Uh, to get involved, but um, I think getting to know people through those kinds of activities um, is very important. Uh, uh, these are people you're going to be practicing with in one form or another as, as co-counsel, as opposing counsel, as arbitrators through your career. Um, so getting to know people early on, I think, is really important. Um, and third, it's get involved in, um, in, in the work of institutions. Um, and others that really shape the practice. Um, I've loved my client work over the last four decades. Um, it's been very satisfying, but if I hadn't been involved in public policy work too, and my own public policy work goes beyond arbitration, you know, my IBA presidency took me into a lot of areas that I'd um, never worked in, like judicial integrity and human trafficking and business and human rights, but even just within the arbitration field, um, having the opportunity to, to shape the practice going forward has been very satisfying. Um, and being able to think outside of your day-to-day -day cases, but think more broadly, um, it adds a lot to one's uh, career over time. Indeed, no, that's very sound advice. I think um, having having had that cross-jurisdictional experience early in my career, I was I also benefited greatly from it. And we've got another question from, from one of the participants, and this is an area that I, I got just up to speed with last week in the context of Hong Kong Arbitration Week quite quickly. Uh, what role do you think technology will play in making dispute resolution more efficient? And with that, where we're looking at not, not just the use of virtual hearings, I think, but more going one step further to blockchain and on-chain ADR. So um, uh, before I... But, before I get to blockchain and on-chain on ADR, I do think um, I, it's, it's essential that we use all of the technology uh, available to us now. And that's really the reason why I mentioned that, for example, in 2000, when we did the arbitration of the millennium, you know, Live Note was something new and, and uh, 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 inspirational to people. Um, it, 
you know, we've got tools now that we never could have imagined uh, even a, a decade ago, um, even five years ago, and we need to use them. Um, uh, we need to use them to shape our procedures um, uh, um, going forward. Um, you know, I, I can't say that I know enough about blockchain um, uh, to understand it um, uh, and how it might be used. Uh, clearly, it allows computerized decision making in a way that we could never fathom. Um, the problem with it in arbitration is that uh, other than ISDS, um, the vast majority of cases are confidential. Um, and so uh, computerized decision-making um, only works if you have a big enough database uh, uh, from which that can be drawn. Um, and so I think that will always be a challenge. Um, I also think that parties will want human judgment, even though human judgment is sometimes wrong, um, uh, but they will want arbitrators who can bring some of their own experience to bear uh, in deciding cases. Um, never, I think where blockchain may be most useful would be in um, mass tort cases, such as we have in the United States, uh, where uh, neg uh, you know, uh, negligence cases go to go to arbitration and the like, and where where you might have a, a big enough volume of cases to use, and where the where the amount in dispute is small enough that the parties are, are willing to to save costs and leave it to that. So, I see it developing really in that way um, uh, for those kinds of cases at first, and then who knows. Um, the other, I I, I, I think. Blockchain technology, though, could also be used to really reduce costs on document production. I mean, we obviously we already use a lot of computerized tools uh, to focus on um, uh, the documents that might be relevant, um, and I I think we will be able to make those searches more and more uh, uh, appropriate, more and more efficient to getting to it, and. My hope would be that could save a lot of money too. So, a rather long answer, but many different ways the technology may shape us. <laughs> I don't think there's a very short answer to any of these technology related questions. Um, so, thank you for that. Uh, we've got another question here about third party funding. And um, of course, with the developments in Hong Kong taking that one step further, um, it's also a very topical one for us. Uh, do you think third party funding will continue to play a role in the development of IA? And are there any risks that you perceive arising from this that we should be managing? So um, yes, and actually, before I answer that question, though, let me let me link your first two questions. One way, the young lawyers who are paying it, who are watching this uh, and are thinking about ways they can shape the practice, is to is to think about technology and to bring the technology to bear, because quite frankly, you are better at understanding the technology. Uh, and understanding how it can be used um, than um, the more senior lawyers at your own firms or the arbitrators you're you're working with. So um, if you propose ways technology can be used to make a case more efficient, um, you will be doing a lot to help your clients and help the practice. So I think that's another answer to your first question about how they should focus. Um, third party uh, funding, um, it's here to stay, there's no question. Um, I think we've largely learned to deal with it um, through greater disclosure. Um, the new ICSID rules are very explicit about uh, uh, the disclosure that needs to be made. Um, the um, uh, code of conduct um, in uh, uh, that UNCITRAL and, and ICSID are working on again uh, focuses on uh, disclosure relating to third party funding. Um, so I think as long as there is appropriate disclosure, it's, it's, it's fine. There are cases, we know that it is expensive to bring claims. Um, and we know that sometimes claims, the parties can't bring claims in part because of the damage that was caused to them, um, um, through whatever conduct it is, whether that's in a private commercial arbitration or in a, a, a claim against a government. So, Third-party funding is necessary in those cases in order to allow the victimized party to uh, to bring a claim um, and and get back to whole. Um, so it serves very useful purposes. Um, 
um, it, it, but it has to be um, sufficiently disclosed uh, that uh, conflicts uh, are, you know, are, are, are protected against in order, and, and that's really to preserve the integrity of the system. I think I've got a follow-on question from that, actually, because this was something we discussed, um, among other things, the third-party funding um, disclosure requirements and the new exit rules at the IBA on Friday. And one thing that was discussed was the perception of a perhaps more robust case based on the fact that you disclose third-party funding because, um, of pe you know, from the council perspective, people who've been through that process know that it's quite rigorous. Now, going into your role as arbitrator in the near future, do you think that kind of um, disclosure would affect your approach to the merits or is that something that people just have to consciously put to one side? I don't think it would affect my view. I mean, um, I know third party funders who uh, take cases if you show them that there's a, you know, a one third to 40 percent chance of winning. Um, there are other third party funders who, you know, Want to want you want they want to know that they've got a sixty percent chance or better <laughs> before they take any risks. Um, uh, so and I you know I think they come to different conclusions at different times. Um, I'm I, I I will start any case. I and I I've sat as an arbitrator and I start any case as arbitrator um, with the belief that both sides um, you know with the understanding that both sides believe they have uh, an appropriate case uh, to put to us. Um, and um, so I, I, I don't think it would uh, I, shape my own view of, of the case. Uh, um, and I've, you know, I've, I've taken cases um, uh, where I told the client at the beginning that we had a 25 or 30 percent chance of winning. Um, uh, and then as you know, we developed the case and as we learned more facts, the case got better and better and we ended up winning. Um, so uh, um, uh, fortunately I've had more of those than cases where I told the client um, that I had, a, we had a much better than 50% chance of winning and then we ended up losing. Um, so um, uh, I don't, you know, so I, I think we recognize that parties bring cases with a, a variety of expectations and up to us to, to see through to the merits. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. It's, it's a more nuanced approach than I think some of the discussions have led people to believe. So um, that, that was a very interesting response. Um, yeah. Just one, one further question. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, of course, in Hong Kong, one of the ongoing questions is, is what the effect that, you know, the current and recent geopolitical developments will have on arbitration in the region. Uh, I'd be interested in your views on that. Sure. So I think, you know, I've been um, honored to be co-chair of the HKISC over the last two and a half years. Um, I have to say, if I remember correctly, my uh, position was announced on the same day as the national security law. Uh, so it was an interesting time to, to get started. Um, I think it's fairly clear uh, so far that while the political developments in Hong Kong um, have perhaps impacted the courts on purely political matters. Um, they have not impacted uh, the courts on commercial matters. Uh, arbitrations are still handled in a, um, in a neutral and uh, arbitration respectful manner. Um, uh, we still have uh, judges uh, who are very knowledgeable about arbitration hearing those cases. Um, um, obviously, the Hong Kong arbitration ordinance has not changed in any way. Um, so I think arbitration has been uh, protected. Um, I think what uh, um, and my hope is that that will continue um, and that as uh, developments um, uh, continue in one form or another, um, that that will remain inviolate. Um, how it will impact parties' perceptions over time. We'll just have to see. Um, but Marielle, as you well know, um, our numbers at the HKIC have remained strong. They have not shown any decline. It's been two and a half years, and certainly some percentage of our cases uh, now have arisen in um, you know in the last uh, uh, two and a half years since the national security law. So, uh, where, I mean, from contracts that were entered into then. So, um, 
I don't know that it's changing the way parties are writing their contracts yet. Um, and Hong Kong does have the advantage um, of uh, the interim measures arrangement, which is uh, terrifically useful for parties uh, uh, who may have cases against Chinese mainland parties to obtain interim measures. Frankly, it's also useful for Chinese mainland parties to get interim measures against others too. Uh, and the HKIC in Hong Kong uh, play a role in that that no other jurisdiction does, and that's going to be important. So it's possible over time that Hong Kong will become seen as more of a Chinese-focused arbitration center, and uh, Singapore and Seoul and others will handle other cases, but we're not seeing that now. Yeah, I fully agree. Our caseload is record um, to date for this year, and it looks like we're going to surpass our, our previous record um, held in 2020. And as you said, David, I can confirm that a lot of the cases that are even coming in in the last few weeks, they're from contracts that were signed post-2020. Uh, so hopefully that, that trend will continue. Now, I see that we're right on time, and I don't want to take up any more of your precious time. So uh, if you've got any parting thoughts for us, um, then I'll, if, if not, then I would close, but I'll, I'll hand over to you, first of all. Uh, well, I'd just like to say, once again, thank all of you for uh, joining us uh, this morning in Seoul. Um, and thank you, Marielle, for inviting me. Um, uh, I appreciate that it was an interesting time in my career, given uh, my retirement as I've reached our mandatory retirement age to uh, uh, look back on four decades. But I hope that I, I think it's important for people to understand um, how the practice has changed in recent decades to understand the opportunities that are there for us to change the practice uh, in an even more uh, advanced and effective way um, in the coming decade. And I hope that the ideas that I put out will be useful to all of you in doing just that. Thanks so much for your time, David, and for your advice and wisdom. I think this was a really fascinating, um, not even a summary because it was far too detailed for that, but a really fascinating look at the last 40 years and how things have changed and also your, your outlook for the next years based on all that experience was, was very, very insightful. So thank you very much on behalf of HKIC for doing this lecture. Um, it's been a wonderful um, learning experience for me and I'm sure for all of our participants and a wonderful start to the Seoul ADR Festival. So uh, with that, um, thank you all for joining in, all the participants, and I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you, bye.